When I turned to the southeast, hoping to explore the arena of the Eighth Colossus, I thought this would be pretty cut and dry. I was wrong. At a glance, it seems we're dealing with some kind of amphitheatre, but it turns out the issue is a little more complicated than that. To kick off my research, the first port of call was Reddit, and I was not let down. As always, there were theories abound. One post in particular argues the arena is not an amphitheatre, rather a well, which I will get into later on. It's a good article, lots of sources and you know I like those, but what really took me aback about this post, among others like it, was its sheer conviction, the hostility in its tone. Further research revealed something curious. The discussion surrounding the Eighth Colossus's arena is emotional, often dramatically so, and this doesn't seem to be the case for any other ruin. There is just something about this particular fictional ruin that drives grown adults into a flurry of blood and thunder. The comment section of the aforementioned Reddit post was a colosseum of its own, sharp words flying about like flaming arrows. It's a well, not a colosseum. Oh really? Tell me. Can you see it from outside like the Colosseum in Rome? The Colosseum is an amphitheatre. Oh, and Vela, sorry. Above I didn't understand I was talking to somebody with special needs. You are literally arguing with the game. He is called the Scaler of the Colosseum. By no, the game please, and the dead. Sure the trophy you get is called the a Scaler. The game is a well, not an amphitheatre. The problem Colosseum. with you is they you don't, don't even know the argument argue of the words you use. Over over you are right, right now. now. It's a Colosseum. Probably you the words are extremely true. Now, to be fair, this was all ages ago, and I'm sure all these Redditors are usually more civil, but I have never seen fans of the game so angry. It really made me reconsider how I was going to approach this video. For fear of upsetting any Colosseumists or Wellists, I will approach both arguments fairly. The TLDR for this video is as follows. Colosseumists and Wellists, you are both correct. You are also both wrong. Here's why. Before going deeper, we must survey the battleground. Colossus 8 resides within a mesa, surrounded by a valley plain. The entrance is an easily overlooked and inconspicuous cave leading down into a complex of tunnels and chambers. Fiery pedestals somehow still burn bright, and a great hidden lake must be crossed to reach a secluded shrine. Deep within this mysterious structure, we have an antechamber, and eventually, we reach the Pale. I call it the Pale, to avoid taking sides in any debate, and it is the closest thing to an official name we have for this location, unless you simply consider the developer codename Underground. The item in question is a subterranean tower, six floors deep, each level forming a circular passage with stairs leading down to the next. These passageways have consistent rows of grills or windows, a feature commonly brought up by Colosseumists in support of this ruin being an amphitheatre. At the bottom, four doorways lead into an open grassy area at the base of it all, the core of the structure. When we first see Colossus 8, it is resting at this bottom level. Alright, pretty straightforward so far. To get a better understanding of this arena, let's now consider Dorman's opinion. Every 
That first part is eye-catching. A tale trapped within a pale. Interesting word choice and certainly poetic. A pale, for those who don't know, is just another word for a bucket, particularly buckets of water. But before the Wellists declare any victory, pale as it is used here could simply refer to the cylindrical shape of the arena. Dorman often uses arcane and florid language. For example, he refers to the Colossus here as a tail. But obviously there is more to the creature than just its backside. It is to this tale we now turn. I've always been of the opinion that any understanding of a Colossus arena is incomplete until the Colossus itself has been factored in. I believe the arena and its inhabitant are always inextricably linked. So what do we know about this Colossus? The community has affectionately dubbed it Kuro Mori. Kuro in Japanese means black, Yamori means gecko, so I suppose the name could literally mean black gecko. Right, nothing controversial so far. Colossus 8 is certainly very dark in colour, and its developer name is Yamori B, so it's essentially confirmed this creature is a gecko of some kind, if the flat tail, splayed legs, and whole wall climbing thing didn't exactly give it away. My first instinct was to study the spiritual and symbolic significance of geckos in Asia, but my results were not stunning. Geckos in Japan are considered house guardians, hopeful animals that eat pests. Geckos are associated with luck all around the world, but luck is a general concept and this lead isn't too strong. I almost gave up, that is, until I discovered something called a moho. Moho is Hawaiian, it means gecko or lizard, and it is also the name of a spirit with great cultural significance in Hawaii, according to an article on Cryptoville. In ancient times, the people thought Moho was a guardian spirit god, protecting people, places, and geographic areas, especially where fresh water springs flowed. According to this and other articles, Moho are shape-shifting entities, often taking on the form of a huge gecko, a shiny black dragon-esque lizard. Moho are usually associated with water, living in fish ponds, and by lighting fires near their homes, they are said to appear. Interestingly, these entities could affect the weather. Nasty moos summoned huge waves, or they would drown others in poisonous phlegm. Many other moos were benevolent, guarding and protecting those who were devoted to them. That delightful image of poisonous phlegm probably piqued your attention. Colossus 8 shoots toxic gases at Wander during the battle. Is it possible Kuromori is basically just puking on us? Black and shiny, dragon-esque, a huge gecko, poisonous sick. Have I just described the Moho or the 8th Colossus? Yes, this Hawaiian legend is clearly an inspiration for this Colossus's design. Gecko spirits associated with water are not unique to Hawaii. Martha Beckwith in her Hawaiian mythology makes this clear. In Tonga, she writes, gods are regarded as formless, but might become incarnate in certain forms. For example, the god Tufa might appear as a particular man, as a shark, or as a gecko. Beckwith also speaks of the Tanifa, a gecko-like creature in Samoan myth that lives in deep, dark chasms and pools of water. These beings could be benevolent, but there are just as many stories of violent and dangerous Tanifa. The association these entities have to water is hard to ignore. The Moho and Tanifa are often said to live in gloomy, subterranean lairs, 
near or under pools of water. In some cases, it can even control water. This, coupled with the image of fiery torches being lit in reverence to these spirits, all serves to remind us of Colossus 8's arena. With that research out of the way, let's now turn to the Wellist proposal. Is the 8th Colossus's home a deep and ancient well? When we imagine a well, what comes to mind is probably a cute stone structure, maybe a little roof on top, and a rope and bucket dangling above the water. There is nothing cute about the pail. To some, the idea this is a well is absurd, but the concept is not entirely without evidence. Perhaps we can already add Dorman's statement to the list of supporting proof as well as Kura Mori's design inspiration. What else is there? Do you remember that Reddit post I mentioned earlier? It suggests something very convincing. It says, The arena in the game is not an amphitheatre. It doesn't develop above ground. It doesn't have any stand for spectators. In fact, although different, it seems modelled after the initiation well in Sintra. The well of which this Redditor speaks is one of two, located on the historic Quinta de Regalera estate in Portugal. It is sometimes called the Palace of Monteiro the Millionaire, after its latest owner, and an article on ancient origins tells us much about its splendour. The estate consists of a palace and chapel with exquisite decor including frescoes, stained glass windows, and lavish stuccos. The estate grounds feature lakes, grottos, wells, benches, fountains, and an extensive and enigmatic system of tunnels that connect to two spiralling wells. The wells in question held ritual significance, although what they were used for specifically is not understood. They probably had some part to play in Masonic practices, and the Ancient Origins article claims the spiralling structure of these inverted towers evokes hermetic imagery relating to death and birth. Even a brief glimpse of these wells reminds us of the Pale in Shadow of the Colossus, and, like in the game, there is quite the convoluted pathway to them. To get to one particular well, Portugal Virtual says one must enter through the Portal of the Guardians, a quote, highly dynamic structure composed of twin towers flanking a central pavilion, under which is hidden one of the underground ways to the initiation well. One important thing to note is this. These wells were not used to collect water they had a purely spiritual, or at least ritual, purpose. So why are they called wells? Does this mean the wellist argument is dead in the water, so to speak? Not quite. Wells, whether they contain water or not, have held spiritual importance all over the world throughout history, not just in Portugal. We need only turn back to those ponds in Hawaii to realise this. Other examples of sacred pools or wells include Nymphaeum from ancient Italy, Greece and beyond. According to the 1911 Encyclopaedia Britannica, a Nymphaeum was a monument consecrated to the nymphs, especially those of springs. These monuments were originally natural grottos which tradition assigned as habitations to the local nymphs. They served the threefold purpose of sanctuaries, reservoirs, and assembly rooms. I must bring up Ireland in this discussion too. John Healy described Irish wells, but he summarised ancient wells in general when he said, In pagan times, the sacred streams were certainly the objects 
of idolatrous worship, and even in Christian times, the reverence for them has sometimes degenerated into superstition. The Bible also makes reference to holy wells and pools of water. The fact is, wells hold great importance worldwide. They began as practical sources of fresh groundwater and over the centuries gained an immense spiritual reputation. Is this too much to speculate that in some places wells would go on to serve a primarily spiritual purpose and less of a practical one? That is the nature of all things. They evolve, sometimes becoming entirely different than how they started. It is possible the initiation wells at Sintra are a product of such evolution. Ancient wells were practical, then they became both practical and spiritual. Now finally, these wells dropped the practicalities altogether and are purely spiritual. No water required. This is just a hypothesis. But the same could be said of the pale in the Forbidden Lands. Perhaps it did originally serve the function of extracting groundwater, the nearby lake being a remnant of this. But extensive esoteric carvings and elaborate architecture would all imply something more spiritual. Perhaps, like the initiation wells at Sintra, the Pale was a centre of ritualism, a gathering place for priests and practitioners of the dark religion we know so little about. Its resemblance to a well and its connection to water could merely be indicative of its architectural ancestry, a distant relative of more practical wells. Adding this evidence to the wellists' argument, we now see things stacking heavily in their favour. But is this the whole picture? No, we must see things from the opposite viewpoint as well. Look, let's be frank, almost everyone assumes the Pale is an amphitheatre. The Team Eco Wiki matter-of-factly describes it like this. After following a narrow path, passing a few waterfalls and streams, there will be a massive lake, and on the other side will be the entrance to the Colosseum Ruins. Even Nomad Colossus, in their blog post on the 8th Colossus, suggests this to be an amphitheatre, going as far as to call it Roman style. However, Nomad leaves room for reinterpretation. It's a strange place, Nomad says. It clearly has windows in which to look down at the central arena, but no seats of any kind. So unless the spectators stood around in groups looking down, must have served another purpose. Nomad suggests, as some others have, that we see a zoo of some kind, an enclosure specifically constructed to contain Colossus 8. However, Nomad rightly questions this line of thinking. After all, the Colossus could climb the walls and puke all over its captors. I do not believe we are dealing with an ancient menagerie, though they did certainly exist. Lardos Games, a Brazilian YouTube channel that has made numerous excellent videos on architecture in Shadow of the Colossus, also argues the arena is most likely an amphitheatre. Despite general consensus agreeing with them, the Colosseumists are in a school of their own. They are adamant that Colossus 8's arena is an amphitheatre. So what real evidence do they have? Firstly, the arena just looks like an amphitheatre, at least initially, and this alone has convinced most people, as we have seen. The windows lining each floor could certainly allow spectators to watch battles down below, and amphitheatres across the ancient world often had tiered seating, richer spectators sat closer to the action, while the lower classes sat higher up. The lack of seating is a minor issue here. 
I think it is reasonable to assume spectators were expected to stand. The corridors of the Pale are very wide, and this may have been to ensure the flow of visitors around the amphitheatre was smooth. One issue I have with this theory is the shape of the overall structure. Observe these examples of amphitheatres from many places and periods of history. Never mind the fact that they are all above ground, unlike the Pale. After all, some amphitheatres were partially built into hillsides. No, this isn't what I want you to focus on. Notice the structure of the tiered seating, each level expanding out as well as upwards. This creates a concentric circular pattern. These arenas resemble large bowls. Now let's return to the pale. It is completely vertical, each level directly above those below and above. Why is this an issue? Well, it isn't so much if you are filthy rich and can afford to spectate on the lowest tier, but what if you're on the uppermost tier? It is nigh impossible to view the battle arena, and one would have to stick their head between the bars to look directly down. It is simply impractical. The reason why amphitheatres were concentrically structured like this was so that all spectators, no matter how high up, did not struggle to see the action. If this is an amphitheatre designed for hundreds of spectators, it isn't exactly ingenious in its design. Regardless, there is one other piece of evidence I must discuss, and it is quite the topic of heated debate. In the PS3 remaster and PS4 remake of Shadow of the Colossus, the player can obtain trophies for completing certain tasks in the game. There is a trophy for beating each of the Colossi, and killing Colossus 8 will achieve a trophy called Scalar of the Colosseum. Pretty definitive, right? Well, not so fast. Never mind Dorman's mildly useful ramblings, the titles of these trophies are arguably straight up unofficial. There were never trophies in the original PS2 version of the game, and it is entirely possible that Bluepoint Studios, the developers behind both the remaster and remake, misinterpreted the function of this arena, and took liberties when it came to naming the trophies. I can hardly picture the studio ordering a strict and intensive research project to determine precisely what Colossus 8's arena actually is. They likely took one look and assumed its purpose. I don't blame them for this. But is that the end of it? Should we completely dismiss the trophy's name? Hmm, I don't think so. Perhaps the title of Colosseum could be applied to the Pale in a more symbolic way. For hundreds of years, whatever function it was built for originally, the ruin was essentially abandoned. When Wander finally arrives to do battle with Colossus 8, he essentially turns the Pale into a kind of amphitheatre, a battleground. Could this simply be what the trophy is referencing? The sudden symbolic transformation of the Pale from a forgotten and decrepit ruin to a site of violence and death? Here's another idea. The Roman Colosseum, also called the Flavian Amphitheatre, was allegedly named after a colossal statue of Emperor Nero that stood nearby. Because a literal colossus resides within the Pale, could the trophy just be a clever piece of wordplay? As for the legitimacy of the word Colosseum, I would say it isn't a crime to use it in reference to amphitheatres in general. Just as how a well can evolve from a place of practicality to one of spirituality, the meaning of words can change. That is how languages evolve. Pegasus was originally the name of a single winged horse in Greek mythology, but the creature is so famous that its name became synonymous with all winged horses. Pegasus is no longer a name, it is a classification for a whole group of mythical beasts. In this way, any amphitheatre can be dubbed a Colosseum. 
This may upset some people, and that is perfectly fine, but the beauty of language is how definitions can transform. That is at least the way I see it. Others may, and will, disagree. So there you have it. As far as I can tell, those are the strongest pieces of evidence in the Colosseumists' favour. Now let's see how these stack up against the arguments of the Wellists, and perhaps the two arguments are even compatible. So, is the enigmatic pale a well or an amphitheatre? As we have just discussed, there is evidence on both sides. If we assume only one or the other can be correct, I am more convinced by the wellest conclusion. But it isn't that simple. It is much more likely this site was a spiritual well rather than for collecting groundwater. The architectural structure of it and the plethora of carved symbolism within suggests this. The idea of a moo or tanifa, a spirit, living within the pale further goes on to support this theory. Another item of evidence to support my assumption may be found in the entrance ruin that leads down to the pale. At a glance, it seems to be a temple or shrine, and perhaps it was. Lardos Games says it bears incredible resemblance to Preya Khan in Cambodia. Preya Khan is a religious site, and researcher Kent Davis tells us it was built by King Jayavarman VII, a spiritual complex made to blend the Hindu and Buddhist faiths. Kent says, With numerous trees and other vegetation growing among the ruins, Preya Khan is flat in design, with a basic plan of successive rectangular galleries around a Buddhist sanctuary, complicated by Hindu satellite temples and numerous later additions. If the Pale's entrance shrine is in fact based on Preya Khan, this would only further imply a spiritual function. This does not completely dismiss the Colosseumist theory. In fact, the Wellist theory could complement its counterpart. Any initiation rituals that occurred in this place, if indeed they did occur, may have involved violence or combat as a means of proving one's worth or dedication. It is the case that a lot of rituals throughout history required participants to commit acts of violence while others spectated the event. In fact, we are almost certain the religious practices of the Forbidden Lands involved death and sacrifice. A huge amount of ancient societies did engage in sacrificial rituals. While the Romans criticised so-called barbarians for such behaviour, the Colosseum in Rome is perhaps the greatest symbol of mass public sacrifice in history. The Roman killing of innocents and criminals was, however, done for more theatrical purposes. Victims were sacrificed not for the appeasement of gods, but for the appeasement of the people. So then, to summarise my point, the Pale was quite likely a religious site, a spiritual well where people gathered to perform sacred rituals, as with many wells throughout history. The location of the Pale was possibly picked for its holiness, maybe the lake nearby was seen as important in a religious sense, just as how the pools and rivers of Moho or Tanifa were sacred to people. Or, perhaps, the location was chosen for its security and secrecy. The initiation wells at Sintra were hidden deep underground, accessible only via narrow, secret tunnels. As for what rituals occurred here, we have little to go on. Given the nature of Dorman and the significance of death in Shadow of the Colossus, as well as the practices of our own ancient ancestors, it can be hypothesised such rituals were brutal. 
The best indication we have of this is the forbidden ritual Wander himself participates in throughout the game. It plainly involves the massacre of 16 creatures. Rituals in the Pale may too have involved combat, or at least sacrifice. In this way, the Pale can also be called a kind of amphitheatre or coliseum where ritualists would observe the suffering of others. This is but one man's interpretation, but it is a genuine attempt to understand the inspiration behind one of this game's most perplexing locations. I honestly don't know if I've convinced anyone, and it is entirely possible my hypothesis is incorrect. However, by diving deep into the evidence and doing research into all kinds of areas, I have assembled an idea with solid facts to prove my points. By doing so, I have learned a great deal of history, and I hope you have as well. I want this video to spark further, hopefully more civil, discussion on the matter, and if you have a perspective I did not consider, please let me know. Just be polite. I think this analysis is a good way of showing how two competing points of view, that of the Wellists and the Colosseumists, can actually merge together to form one cohesive, complete theory. If anything, it should teach us to work together. It is only through cooperation, not conflict, that we can uncover the truth behind this beautiful game. Let the mysteries of the Forbidden Lands serve not to drive us apart, but to unite us. Thank you for watching. See you next time.